What's going on guys? This is Rob and as promised, we are gonna do a video on the origin and powers of the Watcher. Really, Uatu the Watcher, but it also applies to all the Watchers. So what's the origin of this guy? All right, the origin of the Watcher can be found in three different locations. The first one is in Tales of Suspense Volume 1, issue number 53. The second one is in Fantastic Four Volume 1, issue number 13, which is technically when he first appeared. And the second one is in Original Sin, issue number zero, which is a crossover event that Marvel did some number of years ago. Now, the way these three stories all kind of come together and give us the origin of the Watcher is that at some point along the line in the early days of the universe, the race that we know as the Watchers came into existence. Now here's a murky thing about the early days of the universe in Marvel Comics. Even in their own anthology series, A History of the Marvel Universe, which was basically a comic book story that was told, I'd like to believe in response to the video anthology series that I made, what it basically does is not give us any real definitive answers. It just says, once upon a time, the Watchers existed, and that's basically it. In Marvel Comics, when it comes to the early days of the universe, not a lot of information is given there. If you guys recall Tanelir Tavon, the collector from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or the Grandmaster from Thor 3 Ragnarok, those guys are only a couple of them, but you have a group called the Elders of the Universe. They're kind of a loose brotherhood, and the only thing they really share is that they are the last surviving members of their respective races, which had basically died out somewhere along the line. And so you don't really get a lot of information there. The Watchers really aren't that different from that, but we do get a little more info than we do in comparison to like the Elders. What we ended up learning is that in the early days of their society, they had become super advanced technologically, right? They had achieved like interstellar travel and all kinds of stuff. And so they saw themselves as almost kind of like this sort of shepherd for the progression of the universe. And the first thing they believed they should do is share their technology with the universe. And so they ended up coming across a race called the Proselytians, which I know it sounds like a weird name. Hey, comic books. And they ended up giving them the gift of atomic energy. Now for a time, this race had a golden age where they achieved all kinds of incredible feats, right? All kinds of technological achievements. And then they did exactly what you would expect them to do, which is probably what we as humanity would end up doing. They destroyed themselves in a nuclear war. <laughs> and so because of this, the Watchers basically said, no, hands off. Now, this was not an immediate overnight thing. Instead, it happened over the course of time. And it was spearheaded by the father of Uatu the Watcher, a man named Ikor. Now, the idea behind this is that Ikor came to this realization that the only way for the Watchers to really function in the universe, given the catastrophic failure of the race insofar as how the proselytians had destroyed themselves based on the gift of atomic energy is to basically retreat, to walk away from everything. And so i essentially drafted a kind of legislation or an agreement among all the Watchers that they would no longer get involved in any of the affairs of anybody in the cosmos. And instead, they would just watch and they would chronicle. Now, the son of i Uatu, of course, asked the most logical question. What happens if a threat emerges that could destroy the universe, which includes us. And the response and the agreement that was struck among the Watchers is, it doesn't matter. We're not going to get involved. We are not going to have any involvement in this whatsoever. And that was the standard of the Watchers for quite some time. Now, as most of you guys know, Uatu the Watcher basically betrayed that when he warned the Fantastic Four that Galactus was coming. And that kind of set him on the course of becoming more involved in the affairs of people on Earth. Now, as far as the powers of the Watcher go, they are immense. But because of his policy of non-intervention, you almost never get to see them. But over the course of Marvel Comics, they have given us several issues, story arcs, things like that, that really help to solidify what the power of the Watcher is. And these, these kind of instances or displays can be found in really four major comic books, right? So the first two comics come in the form of Fantastic Four Volume 1, issues 48 and 400. The third one here is Strange Tales 134. And the last one is Uncanny X-Men issue number 203. Now, these are not the only times you see the Watcher use his powers. You see it other times as well. But by and large, all the other appearances that you see of him using his powers in Marvel Comics are either just reiterations of what you see in these four comics or some of the things that are mentioned in these four comics actually being shown in those other comic books. But these are really the main four that really tell you what the Watcher's capable of. The important thing is among those four comics that I listed, you end up learning things like in Strange Tales, the Watcher can time travel to any point in the past, present, or future. Even the TVA would be foolish to challenge the Watcher, right? That'd be a fool's errand because all the Watcher would have to do is wipe them out of existence. Why? Because in Fantastic Four Volume 1, issue number 400, 
it was established that the Watcher has vast control over the cosmic energies that exist in the Marvel Universe, so much so that he can actually challenge Galactus. Now, what does that mean? Galactus is a primal force of energy, right? He is literally just energy given form and just coalesces and literally travels around the universe destroying worlds to satiate his energy. But the, the Watcher, much like Galactus, even the Celestials and really like a lot of the cosmic entities can use his control over cosmic energy to do seemingly anything he wants to. He can create life, he can destroy life, he can give people powers, he can take powers away, he can do all kinds of stuff. If you can imagine it, it can be done. And it's an immense amount of power to have. Now, Fantastic Four Volume 1, issue number 48, kind of going out of order of the comics here, but it doesn't really matter. What this established is that the Watcher has telepathy on a cosmic scale. Now, here's the funny thing about telepathy in Marvel Comics. Telepathy exists on a graduated scale in Marvel Comics. At the end of the day, telepathy is all basically the same. The only differentiation between one telepath and another is how extensive their reach is given their telepathic powers. So if you take, for example, somebody who's like a base level telepath, there's nothing special about them. They can read surface thoughts, right? They can read whatever you happen to be thinking at the time, which is, man, I really need to go to the grocery store or did I leave the coffee pot on? Somebody like Professor X, the leader of the X-Men, is way more powerful than that. He can read subconscious thoughts, he can control your thoughts, he can actually make you believe that something you think is your own genuine thoughts, so Inception, I guess. He can do all kinds of cool stuff. Now, look at somebody like the Watcher, his ability to have telepathy on a universal scale, cosmic telepathy, basically means he can read and control the minds of everybody across the cosmos at the same time. There's, there's no real limit to what he can do as far as how the mind works. By all standards of measurement, he's a walking, talking mind stone, right? Of the Infinity Stones, he's a walking, talking mind stone. Now, there are some caveats here. A person who is a sufficiently powerful telepath or even a cosmic entity themselves can resist the influence of the Watcher. Take, for example, Jean Grey. Jean Grey, under any normal circumstance, is not powerful enough to resist the Watcher. But when she became the Phoenix, the Phoenix left kind of a portion of its power with her, albeit she wasn't as powerful as she had previously been, but that increased her telepathic abilities. They were already quite formidable, but all that did was boost them even higher. So somebody like the Watcher could try to scan the mind of Jean Grey and she could block him, right? Now other cosmic entities can do the same thing. Galactus, Eternity, Infinity, Eon, Master Order, Lord Chaos, Ego, the Living Planet. These guys out there can literally just block the telepathic power of the Watcher and keep the Watcher from being able to read their minds. But but lastly, and this is really one of the more interesting things here, in Uncanny X-Men Volume 1, issue number 203, it essentially established that the only way a Watcher can die is if they choose to die. That Watchers are, by all standards of measurement, immortal. The only way a Watcher will die from causes that are external, in the sense that the Watcher doesn't want to die, but it dies anyway, is if, like, the universe dies. Now, that was the standard for years, for years and years and years and years and years. That was the standard in Marvel Comics. There was no conceivable way to kill the Watcher because his durability was just so extreme. I mean, sure, a cosmic entity could, but for the average people who exist out there in Marvel Comics living on Earth, it just couldn't be done. It would take somebody like the Marquis of Death, or the Molecule Man, Owen Reese, or like Jean Grey with the power of the Phoenix Force, or some immense being out there with so much power that they're basically a universal threat. Franklin Richards of the Fantastic Four, right? The son of Mr. Fantastic who can alter reality, he could destroy the Watcher. But this all changed during the events of Original Sin. And the reason why is because Original Sin introduced this idea that the old white guy, Nick Fury, who you may or may not know anything about, there was actually a movie with David Hasselhoff when he played that version of Nick Fury. <laughs> Your first inclination might be to write it off as being ridiculous. That movie's actually amazing. <laughs> I love that movie. But nonetheless, it was revealed that that version of Nick Fury had actually been operating as quote unquote, the man on the wall. That essentially he was protecting the earth from all kinds of various threats. Don't really know why Marvel did that, but the important thing is Nick Fury killed the Watcher. And this basically solidified the Watcher could be killed with conventional weaponry if it was powerful enough. This totally changed everything in terms of the Watcher's immortality. Now more recently, the Watcher came back, but the the important thing is that as far as his powers go, he's exactly what you think of when you think of a cosmic entity. This guy can create life, destroy life, he can time travel back and forth through time, he can read and control the minds of anybody across the universe or everybody across the universe at the same time, with the exception of those that can rival his own telepathic capabilities. The guy's an absolute hoss, but you never see him do any of that because of his policy of non-intervention, which really begs the question, if the Watcher got pissed off enough, 
What would happen to anybody who made him mad? He probably just turned him into sludge. I have no idea. But with that being said, guys, hopefully you found this video interesting. Let me know down in the comments section if you want to see more Origins of Powers videos of not just comic book characters, but just other characters in general. Let me know what you guys think, and I will catch you all later. Peace.